Good morning. Let's stand together and welcome the presence of God into this service as we worship him. How many came to worship? Yeah, we came here to worship God. Praise God. The Bible said, lifting up holy hands unto the Lord and clap your hands, all you people. So while we're worshiping this morning, we're going to practice that, right? Lifting hands and clapping our hands because that's the Word of God. You know, that's as much Bible as repenting of your sins. It is. It's in the Word of God. And if it's there, it must be for us. Let's pray and welcome the presence of God. Father, how we love you, how we adore you, and we thank you for your wonderful, wonderful blessings here this morning. Speak into our spirit. Speak into our spirit. And we give you thanks for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Worship Him today. Spirit is within me. 
Because you died and rose again. Let's sing that again. And I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. And I'm accepted. You were condemned. And I'm Because you died and rose again. Amazing love, how can it be? You, my King, would die for me.
lift our hands and begin to praise him. God is worthy. You're worthy. You are worthy of my praise. You're worthy of all of our praise. For from you are all things. To you are all things. You deserve the glory. He deserves your glory. He deserves all your praise and all your honor. Let's lift our hands this morning in this place. Come on. Lift your hands and begin to praise him. Come on, lift your hands and begin to just give him praise. Let flow from your heart your feelings toward God and, and what, he, what he means to you, God. You're everything, everything. Everything I am, everything I hope to be, it is summed in you. And I worship you, God, and I give you praise. I give you glory. I give you honor. I thank you for your greatness, oh God. I thank you for all your benefits. We worship you. How we love you, God. How we love you, God. How we love you, God. Hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. Oh, God. Just worship God. God wants us just to worship him. 
everything that hath breath. Just praise the Lord. The hour is coming, Jesus said, and now is that the true worshiper should worship the Father in spirit and in truth. I've got to put my spirit into praising him. I've got to put my heart into worshiping him and worship him according to the truth of God. God, I thank you. Oh, God. Holy, holy is he. We worship you, Jesus. We thank you, God. Sing a new song. To heal the sin song. Heaven's mercy Across the house, will you? Yes, Jesus, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! 
Hallelujah. Praise your name. Praise God. Okay. You may be seated this morning. It is great to be in the house of God. Worship flow. Let worship flow. Great to see a great number of people here that is here to worship God. It's all about worshiping God. It's all about giving Him praise and thanking Him. I have a couple of announcements. Then Brother uh, uh, Ferris will come up and receive the tithe and offering. But I want to make a couple of announcements first. Uh, right after service this morning, we will have a potluck dinner next door. And we hope that all of you will stay to be with us. Uh, we'll have a good time. And I know that you'll enjoy that. On next Saturday morning, uh, uh, Koston and, and Jody here, would, would you stand up? They're new into our congregation. Let's give God thanks for them being here. Okay. Now, she's not new to Litchfield. She grew up here. So you can, you can be seated. They're going to be married next Saturday. Isn't that great? Amen. Yes, they are next Saturday. And it'll be at 10 o'clock, and they want you to feel welcome to be here. They would like for you to come. So that'll be at 10 o'clock next Saturday morning. Amen. And uh, also, Wednesday night, you can read on the menu, see what we're having Wednesday night. But next Saturday is a bonfire. We'll have a good time. It'll be a great time of fellowship. And we love the fellowship. It's about the fellowship. It's about uniting, joining together, being with the people of God. And so we will have that next Saturday night. But I especially want to mention that two weeks from today, two weeks from yesterday, is our youth event here. And the youth event will need all of you to be here to back them and support them. They will be doing the, the things that go on, but they need all of us to be here. It will be a great time. Churches will be coming in from various locations, and, and hopefully we have a house packed, and it will just be a great, great youth event. Uh, Christina Link that preached for us, the young lady that preached a few weeks back, she'll be speaking in that service. And I think it's just going to be a great time. We're looking forward to that. So you plan to be here two weeks from yesterday and have a great time with us. All right, Brother Ferris, come. God bless you. Everybody give God praise again, will you? All right, once again, as Pastor Law said, we thank you for coming, being part of our service and this is also a continuation of our worship service it's time that we give an offering now as we study the word of god we find out that the old testament is a schoolmaster to the new in john 10 10 it says the thief cometh to steal to kill and destroy in other words he's a thief and a robber so let's go back into the old testament isaiah says 55 line upon line precept upon precept here a little there a little then go to, let's go back to Genesis 14. Real quickly, Abraham is Abram now. He's piled up with a lot. And there's an opposing army comes into his camp and steals all his goods. He has 300 probably plus men, servants to take care of and are also skilled in warfare. He takes his skilled servants and begins to go out and comprehend that evading army that's stolen all of his goods and takes back all that he has. Now, Abraham and I, um, um, Abraham is one of the wealthiest men and Job in the Old Testament. Now, he takes back all of his goods and the, the kinfolk that, and the wives and women that were stolen from them. But he has a covenant, and he's just beginning in covenant with God, revelation. He stops by a king who has a dual office. Metazedek, who is a king and a priest. He is very wealthy, and he gives him an offering, a tithe, 10% of all that he has. Why? Because he's got a revelation. He wants a stronger partner that sanctifies that 90%. That increase will avail in his life. He has a higher power that's now in covenant with him. And that's our time of worship this morning. We too are going to invoke it with our ties and an offering a higher power to intervene and cause you to prosper in this life that we can deposit into kingdom work and other people's life. So God bless you as our ushers come this morning and you give as God has prospered you and watch God turn this into an increase in your life. Amen. Expect him to come.
love you and honor your name. We love you and honor your name. Hallelujah. Oh, God. Give him praise one more time, will you? I'm glad to see all of you that are here this morning. It's just great to be in the house of God. Great to see all of you. God is good, isn't he? Has he been good to you? He's been so good to me. I could never praise God enough for the wonderful things that he has done in my life. And every day with the Lord has certainly been a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful day. I can't complain about one day in God. Every day in God has been great. This morning, I want to take a little time and I want to talk to you from the Word of God about God rewards your faithfulness. Amen. I believe that. I don't believe that you ever sowed a seed in your life that God doesn't watch and that God doesn't see and that God doesn't take that into account and consider everything that you've ever done throughout your entire life and God molds that into who you will be in the future that is before you. And we are sowing seeds and we are doing things in our life and hopefully that most of us are doing more good things than we are bad things, although you can't be saved simply because you're doing good stuff. you got to know Jesus Christ. you got to have an acquaintance with him. The Bible said you must be born again. And if you have that born again experience, marvelous things can happen in your life. And I, I appreciate the blessings of God. I think all of us at times get discouraged with life in general, just life. We get discouraged with the things that life brings us, the things that we feel like life deals to us that maybe we deserved or did not deserve. We get discouraged with our life. We get discouraged with our family. We get discouraged with our jobs. There are going to be things throughout the course of our life that is going to easily upset us and disturb us. But I want to talk to you this morning about sowing the right seed I want to talk to you about reaping the blessings of God and that God, God will never forget your faithfulness. If you are faithful, God will never forget that. And we need, to, we need to draw from the faithfulness of what we have done for God and in God, and we need to draw from that. If you have your Bibles and would turn with us to the first chapter of the book of Acts, I want to read from there this morning. We need to remember the name of one man in the Bible that stands out in the Word of God, and that is found in the first chapter of the book of Acts, and his name is Matthias. Matthias is not well known by very many people. In fact, if you read the Bible from the book of Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, you will never read the name Matthias but one time. He's never mentioned but once. He is only just dropped into a scripture, but a lot is actually told about him. It is told briefly, it is summed up in just a matter of moments, and in a matter of moments, we learn a lot about this man that is called Matthias. Let me begin reading for you in verse 20 this morning, and uh, let's, let's draw from the Word of God, and let's receive what God has for us here today. Amen. If you love God, give Him praise in the house, will you? All right. All um, right. It says to us, for it is written. Now, he's relating back to the book of Psalms, and he's, he's going back to the things that are in the book of Psalms, and I can't get this to come up, but it, it is referring back to the book of Psalms, and it is giving us a story that has already been prophesied about in the pages of the Old Testament. It is written in Psalms, Let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell there, and his bishopric let another take. Now this is a prophecy of the failure of Judas, how Judas would walk away from God, turn his back on God, turn his back on the work of God, and that he would be found unfaithful. And the Bible said, let his habitation be left desolate. And then it says to us, let his bishopric be taken 
by someone else. And so this prophecy remains unfulfilled for hundreds of years because the event did not come about until the death of, of, of uh, 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 until the desertion of Judas to walk away from God. Now, here's what he is telling us. He says in verse 21, Wherefore of these men, there are two men that have been found in the position that are being considered for the job of being the next apostle of the New Testament. What a job. What a consideration. What a, what a person, uh, what they're being considered for. Now think about this. They are being considered, only two men, are being considered for the high position to be the next apostle of the Lamb. Wherefore, these men, he said, which have, uh, which have accompanied with us all the time. I want you to hear those words. They have been in our company all the time that Jesus, the Lord Jesus, was going in and going out among us. They have been there, these two men. Now, whenever you stop to think about this of all the thousands and thousands of people that Jesus dealt with and that Jesus influenced, Yet when it came a time to pick the next apostle to, repay, to replace Judas, there are only two men that they can find that it can be said of them, they have stayed in our company, they have not deserted, they have never abandoned ship, they have been faithful, they have been here all the time with us as Jesus went in and went out among us. Now, I want to put emphasis on this because in a few minutes I want to come back to it. This is a prophecy that the psalmist leaves us letting us know that there is an opening that is going to come and that Jesus is going to be betrayed and one of those 12 apostles are going to walk away from him and they would come an appointed replacement for him. And this is what was happening. Now, the, the setting takes us in the first chapter of Acts into the upper room. It takes us to that place, that grand moment when the church is about to be born. As I said to you, I believe it was last Sunday, if you are looking for the church, don't go back to the book of Malachi to look for it. It isn't there. Don't look in the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. The church isn't there. The church was born in the second chapter of the book of Acts. It has come to birth there. The outpouring of the Holy Ghost comes for the very first time. There has never been a man nor a woman filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost under the second chapter of the book of Acts. And they have been there for seven days now after the resurrection of Jesus. Seven days have expired. They have remained there. They are faithful. And they are continuing to pray. And they're continuing to seek God. While they are praying for God's great outpouring of the Spirit because He has promised it to them, in the final words of the book of Luke, he told them, go to the city of Jerusalem, wait there until you be endued with power from on high. And so they were waiting the outpouring of the Spirit of God. While they are praying, all of a sudden they begin to pray, God, there is a position that needs to be filled. We have an apostle that has fallen away from grace, that has left you, that is no longer following you. He has committed suicide. He's gone. He won't come back. We need to replace him because there are 12 pillars. And futuristically, when the new Jerusalem would be set, there would be 12 foundations to new Jerusalem that would be named for the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And so Judas, Judas had left, and now the prophecy is being given, and they are there gathered in the upper room. They have been there seven days, about 120 men and women, including the 11 faithful apostles and including Mary, the mother of Jesus, and others who had met Jesus along the way. Judas had walked away, and the apostleship position was now open. And they were praying, God, we need your guidance. We've got to have help. We've got to have your guidance. We've got to have you to come among us. And here's what it says in verse 25, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship. Everybody say apostleship. Now I want you to notice that Judas had, through transgression, had fallen, but he said that they 
may that whoever we pick will become a part of this ministry and will become a part of the apostleship. Now, when the Bible mentions the word apostleship, it is letting us know that they are about to choose the greatest leader position in the entire Word of God. There is only 11 men that has ever been selected to be in this position. And when this guy was picked, he would walk in the same status as did the other 11. And so they had to be cautious. They had to be cautious that whoever they picked would be an individual that had been with them from the beginning, from the beginning, and had walked with them, had not missed anything, had been there at every event of the Lord. I want you to listen to me because I want to preach to you here this morning. There are qualifications to be a part of the apostleship, and those qualifications have to be met if we are going to be a part of the apostles of the Lord. Now, again, let me go back to verse 21. Wherefore of these men which have uh, where, wherefore uh, these men of uh, these men which have companied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and went out among us. We got to look out for men that have been here and have watched Jesus, they have lived with Jesus, they have known the power of God, they have known the touch of God in their life, and they said, we've got to pick somebody that from the beginning, he started with us at the baptism of John, and he not only walked through the baptism of John until the same day that he was taken up from among us, we got to find one that was witnessing to the resurrection of Jesus. Now that began to narrow it down because they were looking for a particular individual who had not been in and out, but one that was so locked in to the life of Jesus that they missed nothing. They were there and missed nothing. Jesus ascended into the heavens 40 days after his resurrection. He went up into the heavens and remained there. Now Matthias is, uh, has seen Jesus go up in the clouds. He had been there and had witnessed Jesus ascending back up into the clouds. He was numbered among the 12 that was there or listed with the 12 that had been there and had heard the angel of God say to them as they all stood mystically looking toward the sky as Jesus went up, they heard an angel speak these words. This same Jesus that is taken up from you will come again in like manner even as you see him go away. He is going in a cloud and he's coming back in a cloud. He's going to come back for those that have made themselves ready. Now, this was the qualification. In order to be a highly anointed apostle of the Lord, they had to have been there to see him, to watch him, and they had to fulfill these qualifications. They had to have seen the Lord from the time that he was baptized in water under John until the time that he was resurrected. They had to walk with him. Only two men met that qualification. Only two men had stayed true to Jesus and never walked away, never left him, stayed there, besides the apostles, of course. And they began to look at these men. And God, they began to pray, God, we're going to pick a leader. We've got to have a, somebody to step in lead, and we need you to lead us and direct us that we might pick the right person. And the one requirement was, there's only one requirement that is given in the entire Word of God, and that is he's got to be a faithful man. He's got to be faithful because if he's not faithful, he'll be in and out, and he'll be uh, not, not continuing with the things of God. We want somebody that, uh, that has been with Jesus from the day of his baptism unto the day of his resurrection, and if we can't find somebody like that, we're not going to find anybody at all. And they begin to pray. And Matthias was chosen to become the 12th, the 12th apostle of the Lamb, and the Bible said he was numbered with the 11. He is mentioned here in Acts chapter 1 and never mentioned again anywhere in the Bible. Never is he ever mentioned again. Now, why was it that they chose him, chose 
Matthias to be the next apostle. Now, I'm, I'm going to preach to you in a minute. I'm still trying to lay a little foundation to you. And they, they chose him. And they didn't choose him because he was the greatest preacher among them. No, that wasn't the thing that made him worthy of following. They didn't follow him because he was the best musician in the church or because he was the best song leader in the church. They didn't follow that. It wasn't because of his great leadership qualifications that they followed. It was because he had proven himself over the years to be faithful to Jesus. He had proven that they had... He had proven over the years, I'm going to stay faithful to Jesus. I don't care who goes. I don't care who comes. I don't care who fails. I don't care who does what. I will stay faithful to Jesus. That's important, isn't it? Give God praise if you believe that's important. Amen. I'm going to stay faithful. Now, he had been there to witness the ins and the outs of Jesus. That's what it said. He was there to see the ins and the outs of Jesus. In other words, he was all about faithfulness. He was all about being there, whether Jesus was coming in or whether Jesus was going out. The Bible said he came in and out among them. He was serving and he was doing things behind the scene. It wasn't for recognition. Nobody was praising him. Nobody was patting him on the back and telling him how good that he was doing. He was faithful in whatever God had called him to do. Now think about that. I don't know. You may not have a big job, or you may not qualify for some big setting. But I'm here to tell you this morning that if you are faithful, God has something for you. Amen. And God wants to give that something to you, and God will reward your faithfulness. If you believe that, Praise him in this house this morning. Amen. Matthias worked patiently and lovingly for God. He worked without, he served and was doing things behind the scene. It wasn't out in front. It wasn't a pulpit ministry. It wasn't a musical ministry. It was without recognition, and nobody hardly knew who he was. They'd never mentioned him before. They'd never talked about him before. But there's something that he was doing that other people recognized. Now, I want to tell you this morning, I want to say this, and then I'm going to move on real quick. When I was preparing this message and thinking about this, I thought about Harley back there because that's the kind of man Harley has been. He'd never been a person that wanted recognition. He'd never been a person that wanted up front. He's never been a person that needed to have pats on the back, but he's always been there behind the scene. And now at 93, he's still here behind the scene. And I think that's a wonderful honor and tribute to him. Amen. Now, we don't even know what these two men qualifications were as far as doing. We don't know what they did. We don't know whether they were mechanical, whether they were uh, builders, whether they were plumbers. We don't know what their jobs were. All we know is this. We know that they were faithful at what they did. And they stayed in there and they worked. And when it came time to go to a worship service, there was never a question about are we going or not going. They showed up. And they never ask one another, do you think we ought to go tonight? And somebody would say, oh, we probably won't get anything out of it tonight. We'll just stay home. That wasn't a question. They had been there. They had been faithful. They had served God. And they knew that they were, that they were serving God not because they needed the compliments of men. They were serving God because they knew that God recognized everything they did. Whether they did or didn't do it, God saw it and God knew what it was. Now, they were, their qualifications came in, but it wasn't based on their talents. It wasn't about who was the most talented. It wasn't based on their skills. They, nobody asked for an education or resume. We want to know what college you went to, how many years of schooling you've got. It wasn't based on that at all. It wasn't based on their knowledge nor their ability to quote the most scripture in the Bible. It was based on their faithfulness and their loyalty to Jesus Christ. And Matthias 
was put into a position not because he harbored so many good things about him, but that he did one thing well, and that is I am going to follow Jesus wherever he goes. I'm going to follow him. I'm going to be there. I'm going to be a servant unto God, and I'm going to do what little I can do to make the kingdom of God look better because that's my job is to lift up Jesus. Give him praise in the house here this morning. Hallelujah. Now, God may call you to do things that may seem small to you, things that appear to be unimportant to you. I go around to churches and I see people that are at the serving lines in the morning and, and when I'm traveling around, I see folks that, that uh, they're there and they're handing out cookies and donuts and making, pouring coffee and they're doing all of those jobs and, and uh, some of the people will come in and they'll say, isn't it wonderful what they're doing? Thank you so much for what they're doing. But they fail to remember that somewhere at 6 o'clock that morning, somebody showed up that's not standing behind that line that fixed that coffee and got those things together and put it out there. And they didn't do it because they needed somebody to pat them on the back. They did it because they wanted the house of God to look better and God to look better. And whatever I can do to improve upon the kingdom of God, that's what I'm willing to do without the praises of men to do it. Hallelujah. I want to praise the Lord. He was chose on the basis of his faithfulness and of his loyalty to God. God may call you to do things, and some of those things might seem so insignificant. You know what? I admire people that when I see them walk across a parking lot, and somebody has dragged uh, maybe a napkin out of their car and 14 people have walked by it and they reach down to pick it up. I think there is a church hero. There's a person that's faithful. They didn't walk by it. They picked it up because they wanted the grounds to look better, because they wanted somebody to know we're proud of where we are. We don't throw our paper on the floor. We don't just walk away and do everything that we want to do. From the time we met Jesus unto now, we're still waiting for the resurrection. I'm going to serve him faithful. I'm going to serve him in commitment. I'm going to serve him with dedication, and I'm not going to expect a pat on the back. I'm going to expect the glory to go to God. Now, Jesus said this. He said, it's not the big things that's always rewarded. He said, in fact, let me tell you, I don't overlook any little thing that you do. He said, if you will no more than give a cup of water to a prophet in the name of the Lord, I will give you the prophet's reward. Now, think about that. Jesus said, that the man who makes the commitment and travels all around this country doing things to improve people's life and to talk to them about the things of God, he said, I will give you the same reward that they get if you do no more than give them a cup of water in the name of the Lord. Now, that doesn't mean that you do it to get the recognition. That means that you are faithful and you are there to commit unto the need that is before you. No matter how small, no matter how insignificant your job may appear to be, God will reward your faithfulness. You might be able to beat me in a lot of things here this morning. We might go to the ball court and you might be able to outshoot me. You might be able to outwalk me. You surely could outrun me. But there's one thing you can't do. You're not going to beat me in faithfulness because I'm going to be in the work of God from now till I breathe my last breath. I've been faithful for over 50-some years, and I'm going to stay that way till Jesus comes. Give him praise in the house this morning. Amen. People may never see the things that you do for God, but the record is being kept in heaven. And God keeps a record of your faithfulness. Matthias was a faithful man. And he uh, was faithful to follow Jesus when he came in and when he went out. Now listen, Jesus didn't stay right on the, the uh, bench with those apostles all the time. He came among them and then he moved out. He came among them and then he went to other places. And he came among them and he went out. But the, the apostle here says... When it comes to Matthias, 
Matthias has been there when Jesus was coming in and when Jesus was going out. Matthias has been there. Now, there are times when Jesus is coming in. I like those times. It feels like revival time when Jesus is coming in. That's a time when you walk into the house of God and chill bumps break out on your body. That's at the time when you know that God is here because you can feel the awesomeness of God. People love that. That's awesome to be in that position. But there are times when you feel like that Jesus has left the house. There's times that you feel like that you just can't get anything going for you. God looks for people that were there in the times of the coming in and the times of the going out. He doesn't look for folks that run. He looks for folks that are faithful, folks that are committed, folks that are dedicated. I want Jesus to find me totally committed to the cause of the kingdom. I don't want him to see me as here and there. I want to stay faithful to the word. Whether I like or feel, feel like it or not, I want to stay faithful to the word of God. I want to stay faithful to prayer. Whether it feels like heaven has turned to brass and I can't get a prayer through to God or not, I want to keep right on praying. If I feel God, I'm going to pray. And if I don't feel God, I'm going to pray. I want to stay faithful to God's house. I want to be here when the doors are open. It's not a question on a Wednesday if I'm going to church. And it, wasn't, it wouldn't be a question if I wasn't pastoring. The day I quit pastoring, I'll be no less faithful to God than I am right now. Because that's who I am. That's not what I do. I don't go to church. I am the church. I don't come just because it seems like the right thing to do. I come because that's, I'm sold out, totally committed, totally dedicated to the things of the house of God. If I'm pastoring, I'm willing to work in the church. If I'm not pastoring, I'll still be willing to work in the church because that's what I am. That's not what I do. I want to be faithful in my attendance to God. I want to be faithful with my support to the kingdom of God. Missionaries around the world are depending on us. We've got to send our funding. We have missionaries that, that without us, they would hardly be able to eat. We are sending them monthly offerings to try to help them do the work of God. As I told you here a few days ago, we, I wrote a little book that I was asked to write. It was 171 pages on important doctrine. And when I finished that, I didn't know what the accomplishment of that was going to be. But as of date, as of date, in India alone, 312 churches have com committed themselves to the message of Jesus and who he is. 312 churches. 312 churches have taken that book and teaching it to congregations and Muslims are turning to God. Hallelujah. Hindus are turning to God. We got to be faithful in the little things. I want to be faithful in my tithing whether I see that coming, uh, uh, looking possible or not. Listen, I have had my times that I've had to go to the electric company and say to them, hey, I've got part of my payment, and I'll try to make the other part next week, but I can't make it this week. But you know what? I've never had a time in 52 years that I've ever walked inside the church and said I can't pay tithe this week because I knew from day one I could not do it. I had to do it. I was committed to God because God is a master in control of everything. I believe that this morning. I live that. That's who I am. I want to be there when Jesus is coming in, but I want to be there when it feels like he's going out. I want to be there when everything is wonderful. I want to be there when everything is down and out. I want to be faithful to God regardless of what's going on because somebody is going to be anointed by Jesus to go to a higher place. I want to be him. <laughs> Hallelujah. Sometimes you can't feel the tangible part of Jesus. Maybe you're going through a valley right now in your life. Maybe you're going through a dry spell or you're going through a wilderness. Maybe you, you are, are just having an overall bad time to happen in your life. What I'm saying to you is stay faithful in the times of the ends 
and stay faithful in the times of the outs. Be there at the infancy of your walk with God and be faithful when it comes a time to breathe your last breath or hear the sound of the trumpet. I can't stop. I can't quit. I can't give in. I can't fold up. I got to be faithful unto God. I see people and have friends all over this nation that they're suffering hurts. They're suffering pains. And because of those pains, some of them are walking away from God. They're still my friends. I still love them whether they serve God or not. I still stop to see them when I drive through their town or take them to lunch if I possibly can to let them know that God still loves them. You got to keep praising God whether you feel it or whether you don't feel it. You got to keep lifting your hands to worship. Sometime I walk through my house and I just lift my hands and start praising God. Sometimes I do that here at church. Sometimes I do that when I'm driving down the road. Whether I feel it or whether I don't, I'm going to do what God said for me to do. And you've got to keep right. right you've got to keep right on going and keep right on lifting your hands and giving God praise because it is proving and showing your loyalty to God. God, I'm going to be there. It may not be noticed by anybody else, Nobody else may even see me being there, but I'm going to be there. I'm going to hang on. I'm going to grip every word that you speak. I'm not going to let the word of God pass my mind. I'm going to grasp everything I can because somewhere, someday, somebody is going to be anointed to come to a higher position and God's going to look for the faithful, not the smart, not the intelligent, not those that are highly educated, not those that are uh, uh, most talented, but God's going to take those on who have been faithful and committed to the Word of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm going to get my reward. It may be unnoticed by men, but I'm going to get my reward because God has never forgotten anything. It's not the wishy-washy stuff that gets the job done. It's not the hit and miss stuff. It's not the... the, uh, uh, the uh, just in and out and up and down. And I remember years ago, there was a pastor that, there was a lady in his church. And, and she was, every time I would go to that church, I would wonder, wonder if she'll be here today or not. Because she was backslid about every other week. She'd come in and she'd go out. And she'd come in and she'd go out. And she'd come in and she'd go out. She was up and down like a yo-yo. And one day I asked a pastor, I said, does she still come to church? He said, well, not right now. He said, we just pray that one day when she gets in, God will just let her die and take her while she's saved. <laughs> you know? and, and you know what? There might be kind of humorous, uh, about, there may be some humor about that, but I'm here to tell you that in all of your getting, knowing Jesus Christ is the most important thing that could ever happen to your life. you got to know God. Unfaithfulness disqualifies you from God taking you to a higher place. Highest calling in the entire New Testament is the calling of apostleship. And all the guys did that be to be qualified and worthy was to be there, be there, be there. They were wherever Jesus was. Be there in good times. Be there on out times. And when people... Uh, be there when people are coming and be there when people are leaving because churches are revolving door and you got to be there. I might not have done much right in my 50 some years of preaching, but one thing I've done, I've been there. I've been there for people. I've been there when I have been wanted. I've been there when I wasn't wanted, but I've been there. And I think that that is a call from people's lives. And when you're going through a storm, hang in there. When you're going through bitter times, don't give up. When you're going through the ins and outs, hang on to every hope that you've got. And through the ups and the downs, stay faithful to God. And when the devil comes along to you and he tries to talk negative stuff to you, you need to let him know, devil, I'm not running off. No matter what you say to me, no, what, no matter what you do against me, I'm here to stay. I'm holding to the kingdom. I've started and I'm on the path and I refuse to turn back. I'm headed for the kingdom and I'm going on. Hallelujah. I'm staying here. 
I'm in the kingdom. I was just sitting here thinking a few minutes ago, my friend Billy back here, when we were kids, uh, we were, I have, I have some friends and I joke them, I, I say, you know, like I'm 71 and they're 75, we were in the third grade together. Well, that wasn't our story, but he was my friend. But back in those days, I remember oftentimes over there in Boxtown, there was a little Baptist church set right behind that uh, uh, sewing, old sewing factory building. And we would go over there because it was kind of uh, amusing a little bit. And those people, they would start shouting and singing and dancing and running the aisles and, and uh, hairpins flying. And, and we'd stand outside the door and watch that. Well, now you don't have to worry about that because people don't do much dancing, don't do much shouting, don't have enough hair to have a hairpin. So everything's changed. But I'm telling you, I wouldn't mind seeing an old-time Holy Ghost outpouring to where people would dance up and down the aisles and the glory of God would revisit the church again. I want a move of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. I want a real, genuine move of the Holy Ghost. I'm not going to fold up when the slightest problem comes by. I'm not going to fold up when a big problem comes by. I'm going to stay in the fight. I'm going to stay in the battle. Jesus is coming back. The Bible said, as they come to the music for me, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is weak. Now, you've got to stay strong. You've got to stay strong in the Word of God. You've got to put on the whole armor of God. Put it all on. Not part of it. you got to put it all on. The Bible said when the spirit of the enemy comes in like a flood, Isaiah said, let the spirit of the Lord raise a standard against it. That means that when the spirit of the enemy comes in against your family, lift the spirit of God up against it. That means that when ill health tries to overtake your body, let the spirit of the Lord Raise a standard against it. When the enemy comes in like a flood, you got to lift up a standard. you got to let them know Jesus is my way, my truth, and my life. He's my hope. He's my resurrection. He's my bread. He's everything I need. Whatever it is, I will find it in Jesus. And there is a power in being faithful. you got to be faithful to God. Matthias had been there. He had been there. He had been there and he had seen every miracle that Jesus performed. Now think about that. He had seen them all. He had missed one thing. He'd been there for every turn of the road. He had heard every sermon that Jesus had preached. Wasn't one of those things like a couple of guys get together and one says, what did the preacher preach the other night? And so I wasn't there. I didn't hear it. You know what? I've, I've had good messages that I knew that would have helped certain people in certain situations they were in, but they weren't there. They didn't show up. You know why? The enemy knew what I was going to talk about, and he didn't want them there because the Word of God might give them some help, might give them some assistance, might give them some encouragement. Matthias was there. He was there to watch the miracles. He was there to hear the sermons. He was an eyewitness to everything Jesus did. When you wanted to know what took place, you could go to Matthias and say, Hey, remember last year when we met at the mount, foot of the mountain over there? <coughs> and Jesus was preaching and the blind men came. Do you remember that? Oh, yes, I was there. I was there. He knew everything that had taken place because he was there. How many of us are there? Now, we are in this building this morning, but how many is really here? How many minds have been channeled into the things of the kingdom of God? Or have we been to lunch already and maybe our next vacation trip? Have we been on our jobs working a little bit and we've been just a little bit of everywhere? Matthias was there. There wasn't any question. He was an eyewitness. A man that has experience, a man that has experience is never at the mercy of a man that has an argument. When a person comes to me and they'll say, I, I remember my early days, I had some friends that, they didn't believe in the Holy Ghost. They didn't believe you could receive the Holy Ghost. And those people would argue with me, and those people would say, oh, you didn't really get the Holy Ghost. You're, you're talking something crazy now, speaking in tongues. Why, you didn't get that. And they were, they were trying to convince me that I didn't get it, but there was a problem. I was there. I was there when it happened. 
I knew what had taken place. And I could say, I know what I have experienced. I don't know what you can get, but I know what I have experienced. I was there. I saw it with my own eyes. I felt it with my own spirit. I know what it is to be touched by the power of Jesus. Hallelujah. And the real experience from being there, I love the experience of being there. I love the old gray-headed saints of God. I became one of them. I've become one of them. Amen. And you know what? When, when you deal with older people, they kind of take things a little easier than younger people. Most of the time, younger people are ready just to fly off and, and, and they look at things and they think, you know, get all upset. And older folks just kind of ride through it. You know why? Because they don't fall apart of it, uh, with every adversity. He's already brought them through some valleys of the shadows of death. They've already experienced some things. They've already seen the hand of God in operation. And they've already seen the times when the cabinet was empty and they prayed and God opened a provision for them. They've already known that. They've already been there. They've already seen that. They already, like David said, I used to be young. I used to be there. I was one time young, but now I'm old. But I could tell you one thing from the time I was young to my old age. I've never seen the righteous forsaken, and I've never seen God's seed out begging bread. God is faithful. God is faithful. God is faithful. And if you are faithful to God, God's going to be faithful to you. i got to be faithful. Every day of my life, i got to be faithful. As we stand together in this building this morning, if you're here and you need something from God, and if you want something from God, or if you're here and you're unsaved but you want to turn your life over to Jesus, wherever you are, wherever you're standing, I'm going to invite everybody in this building this morning to come. I want you to come. I want you to join with me. I want you to kneel. I want you to stand. I just want you to come. Come on, everybody. And we're going to pray and we're going to worship together. We're going to ask God, oh God, let me feel your spirit. Come on, everybody. We all need to be here. We all need to be here. We all need to be talking to God. Whether you're saved or unsaved, it doesn't matter. I want you to talk to God. God, I want to be faithful. I want to be faithful. I want to be committed. I want to be dedicated. Hallelujah. Go ahead and sing for us and God bless you this morning. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So constant. Oh, yes. So loving and so true. So wonderful in all you do, you fill me. You see me. Oh, yes. You know my every I need you, God. More than ever, more than ever, you more than ever, I need you. To see flow, you. Holy Spirit, flow among your people. Thank you, God. We thank you, God. Forsake me in my weakness. I know that you have come down. Even if I love you, I honor your name. I give you praise. I give you glory and honor. To remind me. Yes, Jesus, I ask you to bless this family. Bless this family. Let them find a root system. Let them find a place of commitment to you to dedicate themselves to you totally and completely. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. How I need you. How I need you, Jesus. So merciful and true. So
faithful to you, God. I want to be committed, dedicated to you. Help me to surrender my all. Come up here. Brother Ferris, I want you to pray for Taylor. I want some of you to come in here and pray with her. Come on, gather right here. She, God, we need a new commitment, a new dedication, a new surrenderance. Oh God, we we just have to make it. We we have to make it. We. We can't stop short. We can't give up on you. We can't give up on the things of the kingdom. We've got to keep pressing. We've got to keep pushing. Oh, God, when the enemy would come in and mean it for evil, you mean it for good. When they would take away, you add to. Oh, God, we thank you for that. We thank you for the goodness of your Holy Spirit, for blessings, flowing in our life with blessings. Oh, God, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. Taylor, we love you, honey, we, will, we love you. Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. Awaken, God, awaken, awaken, awaken the giant that is asleep within her. Awaken that, awaken that. I will rise. I will bear witness of your glory. Oh, yes. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. The God of all deliverance is in this building this morning, and God is delivering some people in this building right now. Even when we don't see it and don't recognize it, the deliverance, the deliverance, the deliverance of the power of God is here to set us free. And God is setting people free. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Set us free from our bondages. Set us free from the power of the enemy. Set us free from the spirit of darkness. We break off those chains. We break off the chains of darkness and we claim the power of deliverance by the light of Jesus. God, I refuse to walk in that darkness. I exalt you. I lift you up. Oh, God, almighty God, almighty God. Oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes. Yes, yes. 
How we praise you, God. How we praise you, God. How we praise you, God. How we thank you. You are so wonderful. Right. 